All right, Dorian Mooningham, everyone. Hi, everyone. Thanks for having me. Uh, my name is Dorian Mooningham. I'm Normally what I do is I teach how to create safe spaces for the LGBT community, but since I'm also a member of the secular community, I'd like to bridge that gap and teach what we can learn to make the secular world a more inviting place, similar to what we do in the LGBT community. So secular safe spaces is what I'm going to talk about, which is interesting because we were just talking about secular safe zones. <clears throat> a little bit about me. Uh, as I said, I'm part of the LGBT community. I'm transsexual, bisexual, and atheist, so that's fun. It's like a trifecta of... <laughs> Um, I'm an LGBT and a secular activist in both of the communities. I've done sensitivity training for Fort Worth ISD, Dallas ISD, uh, Plano ISD, and some of the private organizations around, such as the uh, Youth First Texas. Um, I've had a, quite a few public speaking engagements in this last year, which is sudden to me because it wasn't what I was planning to do, but hey, that's great. Um, I'm a mentor for trans teens and other LGBT teens at a youth center here in Texas. It's, it's a non-religious and non-partisan youth center called Youth First Texas. And I'm the host of the upcoming Secular She Thinker show, which will be starting on YouTube this Mother's Day. <laughs> so what is a safe space? Um, it's, it's a word that we throw around a lot, but I kind of wanted to give you a concrete definition. It's a, it's a welcome er welcoming area for all, uh, where you're free from ridicule, judgment, and abuse from your peers. And generally, it's a haven for groups that are usually persecuted. So, for instance, there's an LGBT safe space. Well, we need secular safe spaces, too, because we usually get enough uh, harassment in the religious worlds. So we don't need to be getting it in our own community. I wanted to start off by uh, comparing what our demographics are as far as the non-religious community. 15% um, of the United States has marked themselves as having no religious affiliation. Out of those 15% of the US, 60% of them are men and 40% are women. So it's fairly even, not perfect, but pretty close. 69% uh, of that is white and the other 31% are non-white. As far as political groups go, most of us are independent voters, which isn't shocking, but 34% are Democrat and 13% are Republican. The rest of us are different. <laughs> and as far as age goes, the majority of the secular community is between the ages of 30 and 49. And I actually didn't put this up here, but the majority of the secular community is married as well. So that's some interesting facts. So why do most secular gatherings look like this? Almost all white men, two girls, and one Asian guy, you know. It's not that we set out to do it, but it does happen. Um, so a little disclaimer, I'm not accusing you or your group of being sexist or racist or any of that. I'm just trying to show you how to make things a little more inviting for everybody. So I'll start off with women, because I know a lot about that, being a woman. Uh, like I said, 40% of the non-believers are women. Um, some of the sources of discomfort that I hear about a lot are there's a lack of female leadership in whatever group. There are a lot of sexist jokes or attitudes that are thrown around because it's mostly men. And sexual harassment is probably like the number one. Uh, so here's some suggestions. The secular community is not your dating pool. <laughs> Just because a woman walks through your door doesn't mean you have to start hitting on her in the first five minutes before someone else does. That's creepy, and that will send us away faster than we can get there. <laughs> <clears throat> if a woman does say, no, does say no to a date, it's not because we're a bitch. It just means we're not interested. So get, let go of the grudge already and don't hold it against them. Uh, with the sexist jokes, rape isn't funny, misogyny isn't funny. So get in the kitchen and make your own damn sandwich. <laughs> um, it's surprising how often this happens. And I think it's easy to do when it starts out as a group of like almost all men. It's easy to get into that or to kind of rag on like the one girl in your group. But 
if, if a girl is not okay with that sort of thing, it can definitely chase them away, so try to keep it in mind. And it helps to have a few female officers, because we're just as opinionated and smart as the guys are, so. Uh, Non-white non, uh, people are 31% of non-believers, and common uh, complaints here are, again, lack of reflective leadership, um, racist attitudes and jokes, or little to no community outreach. Um, Non-white people can't know that your atheist community exists if you don't explore outside of all white neighborhoods or all white areas. So try to explore the area and get your name out there. Um, diverse leadership encourages diverse members. If somebody's doing research on your group and they look at your leadership and they're like, oh, it's a bunch of white dudes, maybe I'll go join something else instead. But if it's a little more diverse, it's a little more encouraging to check it out. Um, respecting cultural differences goes a long way. We deal with this a lot in the LGBT community. Not everybody is part of the gay community in the same way, and not everybody is part of the secular community in the same way. Um, I understand the importance of the coming out project and being out, and that's fantastic, but we don't need to put pressure on people if they come from a super crazy religious Catholic family. We don't have to keep putting pressure on them. Hey. You need to come out, you need to come out. Just, you know, leave them be. And racial jokes aren't funny. If you really want to make your one black guy feel even more uncomfortable, try calling him the token black guy. That'll chase him away pretty quick. <laughs> um, the LGBT community is definitely where I specialize. Um, unfortunately, I can't give you hard statistics on how many uh, people in the non-religious community are also part of the LGBT community, but it's suggested that it's a pretty significant number since we usually face a lot of uh, persecution from the religious community. So what do you know? A lot of gay kids run away from religion. Um, some of the things that can be off-putting, and these don't happen that often, but I'm just bringing them up. There's homophobia or transphobia. There's lack of queer leadership. And then there's evolution arguments, which are fun. I'll get into those in a second. <clears throat> um, don't use derogatory terms ever. Uh, tranny is not okay, faggot is not okay, you know, dyke, whatever you can think of, it, it's, not, it's not cool. I mean, I guess if you're friends with that person and they use it, maybe you can, but it's best to just steer clear of it because somebody else can overhear you and um, leave your transphobia and your homophobia at home. It's perfectly all right for you to feel weirded out by the LGBT community, but you don't need to take that out on everybody else. Uh, Guys, gay men are not attracted to all guys. Sorry. <laughs> and uh, girls, we trans women don't use the women's restroom to peep on other girls. We just use it to pee. You know, like, you know, like it's common sense stuff, but you'd be surprised. Yes, uh, queerness has an evolutionary reason and advantage, and it occurs in species besides humans. Has anybody here ever read uh, Evolution's Rainbow? It's a fantastic book but it's all about different uh, LGBT species. We have gay species, we have lesbian species. All throughout the animal kingdom, we have examples of transsexuality and uh, gay sexuality, which is great. Uh, in fact, one of my favorites is uh, in the scientific literature, they refer to gay penguins as uncle penguins. <laughs> and one of the advantages to having uncle penguins in a penguin community is that if one of the penguins dies during the hatching process, the uncle penguins will adopt that egg and keep it alive until it hatches. So there's gay adoption in the animal kingdom. <laughs> <laughs> and again, the diverse leadership can encourage things. Uh, LGBT leaders, especially uh, when we come into the secular community, we've a lot of us have already been a part of the queer community and leading that. So when we join our forces together, we have a lot that we can learn from each other. Um, politics. We're all pretty independent-minded people. 53% uh, of us are independent voters. We're all very opinionated. I guess we can pretend everybody's informed too, but... <laughs> Um, the only common ground between us is we don't believe there's a God, so we can't really go around making assumptions that everybody is this or everybody is that. Um, by all means, debate about politics and everything else. 
because we're atheists, it's what we do best. We love to argue, but you know, it's good to know when to stop. Um, a good place to know when to stop is when it starts getting personal. It, you know, you're more than welcome to debate about welfare, but once you start throwing your mama jokes in there, you should probably step it down and just call it a draw. Um, a lot of times in the group, there's like more liberals or more conservatives, and that can cause a group to gang up on one person with an unpopular idea. So it's something to be aware of if you're like, hey, we need to chill out. We don't need five people telling this person they're stupid. And like I said, the only thing we have in common is our secular views, so don't try to herd cats. It's a waste of time. <laughs> um, obviously, theists aren't part of the secular community, but depending on your group's approach or style, you might want to include theists in your group. Um, our group, the Secular Students at Collin College, tries to be inviting, but we don't have any theists, so we don't have to worry about it. But um, if your group is aiming to be inviting to theists or theists who might be married or in a relationship with somebody who is a part of your group, these are some useful things to keep in mind. If your group is going to be intended for everybody, then it has to be respectful for everyone, too. Um, <clears throat> it's, it's great to say that your group is inviting and welcoming to all, but if it's not really, then you're kind of hurting your own cause. Uh, religious jokes are fun, but you shouldn't use them to hurt somebody. So it's, it's all well and good to poke fun at religion, but once you start getting personal with whoever the theist is, then it starts to be a little hurtful. You know, if you're going to make fun of the Holy Trinity, for example, that's fine, but you probably shouldn't use it to hurt, I don't know, a Catholic or something. So, um, You don't need to make your token Christian, Jew, or Muslim, or whatever, justify the actions of other Christians, Muslims, and Jews, because we don't do that for atheists. So, And know what works with your group. Um, it's okay to be exclusive to non-believers. In fact, that's better than pretending that you're not exclusive and then belittling theist people and making them feel like they've been discriminated against. It'll leave a bad taste in their mouth. Um, these are some of the techniques that I use for the LGBT safe spaces, and I think they're pretty useful in your secular space as well if you'd like to uh, use them. The first one is called Ouch and Oops. Uh, this is non-confrontational language that you can use to say, hey, that hurt, and the other person can say, I'm sorry, without a, hey, why were you such a prick? Back off, man, or dude, I, don't get all defensive. I was just trying to say this. You know, like, this is a non-confrontational way of dealing with it. Uh, so the person who's offended says, ouch, and then the only thing that the person who said whatever offended them is, oops. So there's no, like, trying to justify it or backpedal or, hey, man, it, you know, it's cool. Um, I statements. Everybody's heard of I statements before, but they don't have to sound like a weird therapist drone. It doesn't have to be like, well, I feel that whenever you do this, it makes me feel, you know, it doesn't have to be that way. It can be, I have to deal with enough crazy bullshit from my Christian parents, rather than you're as bad as my crazy Christian parents. Um, just making it about you means that you're not attacking the other person. So, like I said, it doesn't have to be creepy, weird therapist language. Um, this rule must be present basically is uh, you don't talk about specific people unless they're there to defend themselves. Um, this way you can prevent gossip and rumors and talking behind people's backs and drama and all the rest of it. Um, I told you I volunteer for a queer youth center and man does this rule have to be enforced a lot because oh my goodness you mean teenagers have a lot of drama? And queer teenagers have even more drama. <laughs> so this one will be good for uh, making sure that nobody is getting talked behind their back, because usually that's even more hurtful than what you're actually saying. By all means, confront people when they need to be confronted, but you know, actually confront them, do it to their face. Um, this rule, stand up and step back, is a good way to encourage diverse leadership and a, a more diverse voice in your secular community. Um, the stand-up is specifically aimed at people who don't normally 
uh, speak up. So if you're like that shy, quiet person in the back who doesn't really, you know, let your opinion be known, you should step up and you should tell people what your opinion is. But if you're, you know, that person in the front who's a loud mouth and is already one of the officers and you always let your opinion be known, you should keep in mind that it's good to step back now and again so that that quiet person in the back can step up. Um, by doing this, not only can we create equality, which is awesome because that person in the back feels like their opinion is just as important as yours, but then you get new ideas because usually those quiet people have some really smart things to say about what we can do in our community. Um, my little uh, reminder of how to think of your safe space is got rice. Rice stands for respect, integrity, compassion, and equality. Respect means uh, no one deserves to be treated like a lesser person. Um, just because somebody's different from you doesn't mean you have to bash them about it, which should go without saying, but I'm just, you know, doing the safe space thing. Um, don't talk over people or belittle them, even if in your opinion they have the wrong opinion. You know, uh, give everybody the space to say what they need to. And even if you can't respect the opinion, you should always respect the person because we're all there to help each other and further the secular movement. So even if you disagree, don't be an asshole is the boiled down version of that rule. <laughs> Integrity is about knowing when to step up for others and when to step back when you're wrong. And that's the part that a lot of people have a hard time with. We usually have a pretty easy time stepping up for things that we think we need to fight for. But it's that whole, ooh, I'm sorry, I shouldn't have said that part that is hard for a lot of people. Um, it's a lot better to just not get all defensive and be like, you're right, I'm sorry, I shouldn't have you know, done that, said that, whatever. It's about taking responsibility for your actions, including the ones that you're a little embarrassed about. So um, always take the moral high ground, because the last thing we need is some atheist who uh, takes the moral low ground, and then that'll just reinforce the stereotypes for us. They already think we're baby eaters and uh, Satan worshipers anyway. We don't need to help them. Compassion is about being supportive and understanding to each other and offering a helping hand when needed. And this doesn't just go for our community. We need to do it for the rest of the world out there, too. Uh, when the rest of the world sees that we're helpful and loving, then they'll say, hey, those atheists aren't so bad. Um, giving others your full attention and actually listening to them. Sometimes this is a common problem. Uh, rather than just waiting for your turn to speak, it's helpful if you actually listen to what the person is saying. And meet people where they are is an important uh, reminder too. If somebody is deep in the closet about being an atheist and they can only come out at your meeting, just meet them where they are. Don't try to pressure them into being who they're not because they'll get there on their own. And the last one is equality. Again, going back to the no such thing as a lesser human being. Um, all the voices in your group should be heard, even if you have to make special uh, attention to get that other person to talk. And everyone deserves an opportunity to shine. If you only have a few different uh, events in your group, try considering making more events that different people might be interested in and giving them the opportunity to do that and diverse leadership creates diverse membership once again. Uh, these are some of my works cited. There's the American Religious Identification Survey of 2008. I told you I could really find hard statistics on uh, queer atheists, but Australia has some, so I use that. And I'd like to thank Youth First Texas and Felicia Porter who gave me my safe space training. And thanks to everybody who helped me put this presentation together. So. Any questions? David. You know, it's interesting in my interactions with the uh, LGBT community, there's actually a lot of overlap between atheists and the uh, queer community. And even uh, theists who are LGBT members 
Um, I work with the Cathedral of Hope sometimes because they give my youth center money, so I'm not going to tell them, oh, I'm an atheist, screw your money, you know. <laughs> um, but even the theist LGBT members are very supportive of the secular community in, in my experience. And I think it's because we've, both of our groups have had to deal with that crazy, radical, Christian aspect of society. So when you're asking for people to be an ally for your movement, such as the LGBT movement, that means that you have to be an ally for other movements that are similar to yours. So I think uh, by inviting more overlap between our groups, it, we can be an unstoppable force. <laughs> Anyone else? <laughs> yes. Mm -hmm. I mean, I wouldn't think of it as, as, I wouldn't think of it as quotas so much, you know, <laughs> um, because this is the national average, and of course, depending on where your group is, the actual um, percentages in your area are going to be different. I think more of the focus just needs to be on being inviting to other people and making it a place where. Uh, I mean, the primary complaint about women in the secular movement is just getting hit on like way too early and way too frequently. <laughs> um, so really just keeping that in mind, you'll probably get more female atheists. It's just because there's more of a, uh, I'm trying to think of the word, more of an emphasis on women in the theist world as women are supposed to be the keepers of the faith, especially in the Christian community. I think that's why they're are a, percent, a smaller percentage of Christian women, but I also think it's why there are probably fewer out atheist women. Not only that, but we don't have a whole lot of role models. You know, we have the four horse men of the apocalypse, but we don't have the four horse women of the apocalypse. You know, so Dawkins and Dennett and Hitchens and Harris are great, but we don't really have somebody on that same level who's an out atheist and who's female. So it's hard for somebody who's an atheist female to come out because you don't really have somebody to look up to. I love Madeline Mary O'Hare. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's unfortunate what happened to her because she was awesome. Matt? Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. Well, a great example is the, the billboards that have been going up in uh, South Dallas. I don't know if you guys have seen those, but it's, uh, it's specifically geared towards African Americans who are non-religious, and one of them has... Uh... Yes, thank you. <laughs> I was blanking on his name. Um, but that's something to keep in mind, because you're right, uh, having, you know, like you said, a privileged white male going into a neighborhood probably isn't the best way, but going back to the diverse leadership 
encourages diverse membership. Um, just getting a few members can kind of have a, uh, I guess for lack of a better term, like a snowball effect where if other people can see that that group is safe for them, it'll encourage them to come and join it also. And not only that, but encourage them, people, if they want to, to make their own groups that specialize in different things. Um, like we have the Secular She Thinkers, which is part of secular students at Collin College. It's not that we don't have a lot of girls and secular students at Collin College, because we do, but we wanted to do something that was just for the females in our group. And that doesn't mean that we're breaking off from this one. It's just we're specializing a little bit more and providing something for the women in our group. So. I love Jamila Bay. <laughs> Kevin. Yeah. Well, and that's it. It's kind of one of those things where if you create a safe space, they will come. It's all you know. It's like if you build it, they will come. So you know, you don't need to beat yourself up about it. Just try to keep in mind: are there things that we're doing that might be discouraging demographics? But you're probably not. It's just something to keep in mind. And making a safe space isn't specifically about diversity. It's just making a place that everybody can enjoy going to because they don't have to worry about getting chewed out when they go there. Do you have another one? It does. As one of those low-income people who uses public transportation, yes, yes, it helps. <laughs> mm -hmm. That's a great one, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I remember when you guys were in the uh, in the gay pride parade because my uh, youth center was like right behind you guys and I was so excited that you guys were there, especially with your atheism is fabulous shirt. Those were amazing. <laughs> that Kevin is modeling right there. <laughs> Do we have street fairs? I think the closest that we have is like the farmer's market, but that's, a, that's about it. I mean, you're from San Francisco. It's like the hippie area. We're in Dallas. <laughs> yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, those are some good ideas too. And the, I don't know if you heard her, but she said a uh, county and state fair could be a good uh, recruiting place as well. Assuming that they'll approve us, they might, they might claim that, uh, oh no, we don't allow religious people onto the uh, state fair grounds. Similar to the, uh, what, the bus campaign and the movie theater campaign that's been going on now with, <laughs> yeah, that's not going on, I guess, is the, <laughs> yeah. I heard we got like in the in the newspaper they quoted it as an Easter miracle that we might actually get to do the movie theater uh, recruiting. For for those of you who don't know, it's uh, is it D, it's DFW Core, right, Kevin? Um, DFW Core is trying to run their. If you've seen the billboards that say uh, our families are great without God, they're trying to get those run in movie theaters in the DFW area. And surprisingly, every movie theater that they go to instantly has a no religious affiliation rule <laughs> that they previously didn't have, but all of a sudden, oh no, they've always had it. Similar to when they tried to do the uh, campaign on the DART buses, DART bus decided, you know, cons uh, incidentally, 
that they weren't going to have any religious advertisements on their buses anymore, which I guess is sort of a little victory in and of itself, but... <laughs> Thank you, guys.